the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Honan, a member of the faculty here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Ask With Forum presentation. Uh, the Ask With Forum is a series of public lectures here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and the forum showcases le various leaders in the field of education with the hopes of sharing new knowledge, generating good conversation, and offering insight in some of the highest priority issues facing education today. For further information on other Ask With Forum presentations, please feel free to visit uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education website and you'll see a, a list of our additional presentations to follow. Um, we are delighted and pleased this evening to welcome a Harvard Graduate School of Education alum, Debbie Biel, uh, to make her presentation with us this evening. Uh, this particular year is also very special because Debbie is a distinguished visiting fellow here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she has been speaking to various classes and student groups, including, I'm told, a couple of groups today and my class a couple of weeks ago. And so in this role, she's been sharing her expertise and wisdom with a, a large number of our faculty and students here at the Graduate School of Education. Uh, as you well know, Debbie is a founder and president of the Posse Foundation. And if you uh, have followed the history of Debbie's work, uh, a very simple idea, a powerful idea that turned out to be a very widespread and very popular college access program. And it was just wonderful for those of us who knew Debbie as a student to watch her work develop over the years in this work. Um, since its uh, first cohort, the Posse Foundation has uh, sent more than 300 uh, or 3,000 uh, scholars to top tier colleges and universities. And these institutions have awarded these students over $334 million in scholarships. Um, Debbie, in, in uh, 2007, uh, received the MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, recognizing her work in this field. And last March, the Posse Foundation was one of only 10 organizations named by President Obama to receive a portion of his Nobel Peace Prize award money, and that was awarded to the Posse Foundation. So we are just delighted to both welcome Debbie back, but also welcoming her this year to be with us in this work. The title of her talk tonight is The Politics of Race and Class in Higher Education. Please join me in welcoming uh, Debbie Beale. Thank you. Okay, I'm turning this on. Hi. Better? Can you hear me? Yeah? How many of you have had Jim Honan for a professor? Okay. All the rest of you need to take his class. <laughs> He's fantastic, one of my favorite people. So thanks for the intro. The light? Not yet. I just, um, I'm excited to be here, and I thank you all for, for believing that this might be a little bit of an interesting lecture, and I hope to leave a lot of room for dialogue and question and discussion and answers and stuff at the end. I, I don't know how many of you came thinking I was going to talk a lot about posse. I'm not going to talk a lot about posse in this presentation, but what I am going to talk about is the context in which posse exists and hopefully um, poke everybody a little bit into having a more intense dialogue about race and politics and how they play a role um, in higher education. OK, so could we turn the lights down a little so we can? That's good. That was up. <laughs> What is smart?
Now, whether you think each of these people that you just saw is or was smart is really not that important. For sure, we know that each of these people was successful, wildly successful. A great scientist, the president of the United States, a multi-billionaire. Sorry, I'm trying. The most successful television talk show host of all time, a civil rights agitator, a Supreme Court justice, a movie star. We think smart connects to success. And this country pretty much believes that the way to success is through its educational system. And you have to be smart to get into the best schools, right? So here's what I'd like to present over the next few minutes. There are so many people who are smart, who have the ability to learn and understand, but who don't show up through the measures that we currently rely so heavily on to screen for college admission, especially at the most selective colleges and universities in this country, which we all know often best position their graduates for leadership positions in the workforce. Because so many of these people who don't show up are disproportionately black or Latino or poor, we need to take a hard look at our assessment and evaluation processes and at the responsibility that these institutions of higher education have to society. If we don't, we risk perpetuating a class system based on race. We all realize that a great education can be invaluable, and there are some schools that clearly are outstanding, right? Exeter, Stuyvesant, Roxbury Latin School at the secondary level, and then, you know, at the higher ed level, Harvard, and some of these other schools are, are also good. <laughs> but the politics of race and class come into play when we ask the following question. Who deserves, who deserves to go to these schools? Who deserves it? And how do we determine, how do we know, how do we determine who deserves to go to these schools? Well, because not everyone can attend, right? There's a limited number of slots at the best schools. We have developed a system to identify those students who should be admitted. We want to match students with the schools that fit their capabilities. So, you know, we live in what we call a meritocracy, and those who earn the highest marks, those who achieve at the highest levels, are those who deserve to be admitted to the top institutions of, higher, of, of education. And it, it also embodies the idea that without a system of evaluation, we might risk setting a student up for failure. So what do we rely on? We rely on grade point average, on high school ranking, and, of course, test scores. So, I want to talk a little bit, wow, what is that? You know what that's supposed to, <laughs> I don't know what that is. That is supposed to be the word merit. <laughs> Let's hope that is the only slide. That's really weird. I want to talk a little bit about the word merit. Merit, meritocracy. This country is supposed to be a meritocracy. The idea is that we have a system in which everyone has an equal chance to succeed. The talented are chosen and moved ahead based on their achievement. Those who deserve to move ahead, move ahead. And if you merit something, what does that mean? You earn or you deserve something. You have a praiseworthy quality, behavior, talent, or conduct worthy of reward or honor. 
our rewards and honors for and in higher education go to those who excel. An example, many of you have heard of the National Merit Scholarship Program, right? Yes? Yes. It might be the best, well, best known uh, recognition and college scholarship program in the country. They clearly identify their criteria for the award. You can look it up on their website, and it says, quote, high school juniors may qualify for national merit scholarships by receiving a high score on the PSAT. That's their only criteria. That's it, the only criteria. And I want you to remember this because I'm going to talk about scores a little bit later on. But basically, my point is we have come to equate merit scholarships with high test scores. The problem is we haven't created a system that puts everyone on a level playing field. So let me give you some context. <laughs> <laughs> this shows you the percentage of Americans living below poverty level by race. And you can see the discrepancy. 23% of Hispanics live below the poverty level. 25% of blacks, 9% of whites, 12% of Asians. These are unemployment rates by race, and we know things are bad right now in this country. These numbers may not even really accurately reflect what's going on. But blacks and Latinos are unemployed at much higher rates than whites. And then you look at what's happening with high schools. Nationally, we graduate about 71% of our students from high school, but if you look at the biggest urban public school systems, 53% of our students are graduating. And when you look at Detroit and Cleveland and Indianapolis as examples, it's beyond pathetic. And when you think about who is in those public school systems, right? In Indianapolis, it's 55% uh, black. 16% Hispanic, and 84% of the students in that school system get free or reduced lunch. In Cleveland, 70% of their student body is black. I know this sounds really weird, but this is the statistic. 100% are low income. In Detroit, 88% of their student body is black. 77% are low income. So while it may seem obvious, and I think for the people in this room you probably understand this already, schools with a majority population of students from poor backgrounds have much, much, much lower college going rates than schools with students from a majority of wealthier backgrounds. So let's look at higher ed. Current demographics in this country, you know them, 65% white, 15% Hispanic, 14% black, 5% Asian. But we project the population to change by 2050 where whites will no longer, non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority. And we all know the fastest growing population is the Latino population in the United States. But when you look at who's getting the four-year degrees, it's majority white students. This has tremendous ramifications. I'm gonna t I know this might be hard to look at. I'm going to just spend a minute on this slide. This shows enrollment rates for Hispanic, black, and white students. It's an interesting slide because it tells you that still today, after 30 years, blacks and Latinos are still going to college at much lower rates than white students. But there's one point on the chart, do you see it, where the three lines come together? Yes, in the late 70s. And do you know what was happening then, why, why that was? What? You're saying all the right things. I just schools were, uh, I think, implemented at much higher rates at that time. But why? Why were the school? Why were the GI Bill? What else? 
right, affirmative action had kicked in, right? We had this big civil rights movement in this country, and affirmative action policies were kicking in. We had the Pell Grant happen then. All of these things converged, and it, guess what? I mean, it gives me chills. We had everyone going to college at the same rate. It has never happened again. We blew it. We blew that. And the backlash to affirmative action, the rising cost of college, all these things converge, and we can't, we can't seem to get it together. This shows you who's graduating from college. And for a long time, this country has been just talking about blacks. They brought in Latinos and whites. It used to just be black and white. But they started collecting data on Asian students. That, that's great. We of, often leave Asian students out of the, the dialogue. But you can see here that there are radical differences, radical gaps in graduation rates for blacks and Latino students at the bottom and whites and Asian students at the top. We're just nowhere near equity. So compounding this issue, remember we're looking at poverty, we're looking at school systems and who's dominant, right, is the cost of college. It has become this insanely expensive proposition. And when you look at, at the cost of college as a percentage of median family income, and this is over a period of the last 10 years, basically, it really hasn't become much more expensive for, for people from the wealthiest backgrounds. But for people from the poorest backgrounds, it has become a bigger and bigger and bigger percentage of their family income. So it's almost impossible to think about affording college. So, yeah, okay, so who's graduating, right? This is, look at this statistic. 75% of young people from high SES families, from, from wealthier backgrounds graduate compared to 9% of young people from poorer backgrounds. And so when you look at who's making up the percentage of student, of the student bodies at the top institutions of higher education in the United States, 74% are coming from the top quartile uh, income level in the United States. Okay, now we're going to add standardized tests. So they, well, you know, we can't put enough, enough barriers in the way, but, so standardized tests. And I'm really not, I'm not anti-standardized tests, although it may seem like it after this presentation. But <laughs> <laughs> This is my absolute favorite slide, and I'm going to spend a minute on it, because it, it'll take you a minute. I, I'll, I'll walk you through it. The, we wanted to know if you think, you know, there's about 1,400 four-year institutions of higher education in this country, uh, four-year institutions. And if you took the top 10%, let's say the top 150 colleges and universities, and you asked this question, well, how many black kids and Latino kids and Asian kids would they need if they wanted to have the same percentage um, that, that exists in the US population? Well, on the, on the left, it shows you, the, on the bottom, the black says you would need 48,239 black kids every year at the top 150 colleges, if you wanted to represent the 14% of blacks that live in the US. Okay. So we said, okay, well, let's find out, because they, we know these top, top schools rely heavily on test scores, SATs. So we said, well, let's look at, at SATs. Let's see how many black kids last year scored, and we'll, we won't even be radical. We'll, be, we'll say 1,200 on their math and reading scores combined. We just did math and reading, or above, 1,200 or above. And we found that only 6,800 black kids scored 1,200 or above. So you need 48,000, but only 6,800 scored 1,200 or above. I'm just letting this sink in for a second. A side note, if you wanted to know how many of those 6,800 Black kids were poor, 900 of them. And for those of you 
you know, in classes here at the Ed School, you know we've been having this discussion about financial aid and should we use class as a proxy for race and all that. Okay, same thing for Latino students. You need 61,568 Latino students if you want to represent the 15% that, that exists in the American population. But only 15,500 scored 1,200 or above. Now, if you really want to look at the, the rest of the slide, you can see that Asian, which is kind of the orangish bar, we need 13,000 Asian students, but 50,000 Asian students in the US score 1,200 or above. But, so you're seeing an issue. What's the issue? If our institutions of higher education, the selective institutions, rely too heavily on the SAT, for example, they're not going to achieve their diversity goals. They're just not. So here's what we end up with. We end up with our top institutions of higher education, and this is true, poorly representing blacks and Latinos. While the population has 14% blacks, the top 150 schools in this country, their student bodies, have only 6% black students. Same for Latinos. Population's 15% Latino right now, but only 7% are represented in the top institutions of higher education. And we know how important the degree is. You got to get the degree, right? If you're going to get the degree, it'll help you make money. So, sorry. So, we know that when you have less than a high school education, your median income will be $24,000, all the way up to a professional degree where your median income is $100,000. So we see how important a college degree is in determining your income level in the, in the workforce, but where you go to college is also enormously important in determining who has access to the top jobs. The industry-leading companies and organizations in the United States think Goldman Sachs, right? Recruit from, for the most part, the top colleges and universities in the country. And because whites are overrepresented at the most selective colleges, we now end up with very little diversity in the pool of candidates for the top jobs. It's amazing if you go company by company by company by company and you look at the top 10 to 15 executives at the Fortune 500 companies. I'll show you some stats in a minute. It is amazing that it's 2010 and everybody's white. So managers and professionals are still overrepresented by whites. I thought you might be interested in seeing what the, your state legislators look like. or your United States Senators. Okay, here we are. This is not news, you probably know this. Of the 500 CEOs, five are black, seven are Latino, seven are Asian, 15 are women, and some of those overlap. <laughs> but. We thought it would be interesting to look beyond the CEOs at a broader group. And so we recently did an analysis of, of the race and gender of almost 800 top executives at 80 Fortune 500 companies. Um, we, we were using the seven cities that Posse exists in. And here's what we found. 91% are white. It's almost 800 people. These are the people leading huge companies with lots of power and influence. They're hiring people for incredible jobs, and this is the leadership. 2% black, 3% Latino, 4% Asian, and by the way, only 17% are women. I'm going to stop showing you slides. I understand the fear that 
well-meaning individuals have when they express concerns about setting students up for failure. But just because we're failing our students so abominably in our K through 12 system doesn't mean that we also have to punish them by keeping them from future opportunity. Who are we really setting up for failure? We're setting the nation up for failure. What we need is to recognize talent and intelligence and potential for success even in the most under-resourced environments. We need to find the smart, the talented, the ambitious in every school. And these kids exist. I know, I know they exist. Because for the past 21 years, I've been watching these very young people succeed. In fact, more than 3,000 students have come through the Posse Foundation, all of them from major urban public school systems, 80% of them black and Latino, 80% of them from high need backgrounds. They're graduating at a rate of 90% and they're going on to become leaders in the workforce. And if you think that it's just 3,000 kids, we had 12,000 nominations this year for Posse. 12,000 nominations from people who believe in these young people. And these are the young people that are not getting connected to the opportunity. I want to give you a few examples. Shirley, Posse scholar, grew up in Brooklyn. She's Dominican. Her dad drove a taxi cab. Her mom was a secretary. She scored a combined 800 on her SAT. She became one of the first Posse scholars, went to Vanderbilt University, graduated with honors, got her doctorate in clinical psychology from Duke University, and she is now the dean of the college at Middlebury in Vermont. I could keep going. <laughs> Regina, I'm not giving last name, scored 930 on her SAT combined. She's from South Central LA. She went to UW Madison. She just finished her master's degree in education at Berkeley. Jamal got 910 on his SAT. He went to Vanderbilt University, got his degree at Harvard Divinity School, and he's running for public office in New York. Duran got 1,000 on his SAT. He attended high school in the Bronx. He went to Wheaton College. He's getting his master's at Cambridge University in England. He won a Fulbright, a Davis, a Marshall, and he was a Rhodes finalist twice. I know. <laughs> Last one, Carlos got an 890 on his SAT, graduated with honors also from Vanderbilt, worked for Lehman, worked for Bloomberg for five years, saved up money. Now he's an entrepreneur. He opened a successful tapas bar in the Upper West Side in Manhattan. How cool is that? <laughs> Are they exceptions? I know, people sometimes, well, they're, million, they're exceptions. They're not exceptions. But they are only a few of the thousands who should be thought of as deserving and meritorious, young people who should be getting the best education possible and be in a position to take on leadership positions in the workforce. Let me acknowledge, there are initiatives underway to close the gaps, right? The gaps in SAT, the gaps in college going rates. There are community-based organizations, there are dedicated institutions of higher education who've developed programs to help ensure that we build more diversity in our college and university student bodies. But too often, they define themselves by the deficiencies of the populations with which they work. What do I mean? They're at-risk programs. They're poor kids programs. They're minority programs. They look for alternative programs to compensate for the gap in enrollment rates for students from underrepresented backgrounds and majority students. But what ends up happening is that, often unintentionally maybe, they create further racial division. Perception becomes warped. Whites win merit scholarships. Blacks win athletic scholarships, minority scholarships, community program scholarships. By awarding merit scholarships predominantly to white and Asian students, we perpetuate a stigma, a stigma that blacks and Latinos are less deserving, less smart, 
and probably on campus because they're athletes or charity cases. You know, I, rem I remember Keto was one of our first Posse scholars in the first few years. Tall African American kid, and he said he was walking down campus one day, and someone came up to him and said, Oh, you're here on a scholarship? Well, what team do you play for? And I think that's not an uncommon experience. It's an assumption that we make, and we are all responsible for that. I I'll give you an example. I'm going to revisit the National Merit Scholarship Program, and I certainly don't mean to pick on them. They do great stuff, it's, they're wonderful. In an effort to engage and acknowledge more African-American students, do you know what they created? They created the National Achievement Scholarship Program. It's only open to African-American students. But we still end up with two programs, one called Merit and one not called Merit. We need to do two things. We need to make sure that we include everyone in our definition of diversity. Blacks, whites, Asians, Jews, Pakistani, Native Americans, everybody you could think of. Diversity is not and should not be a synonym for minority. Second, we need to expand our definition of merit. If we make that possible, we begin to equalize the playing field, and we will end up with a new kind of leadership network in the United States, one that better represents the country's demographics, and one that will more likely understand the concerns and the needs of all Americans. And the way we can identify real diversity of students and talent is by using a broader set of measures, measures that look at other predictors for success, such as leadership, initiative, communication skills, problem-solving skills, why would we value these any less? There is no reason in the world that we shouldn't acknowledge that students can show their potential to succeed in different ways. We recently at Posse, we recruited the CEO of Royal Caribbean in Florida to the National Board of Directors. And the other night I was at an event with him and he had just met 30 of the newest Posse scholars from the Miami-Dade County Public Schools. And he said to this crowd that had gathered, that he was talking to, he said, quote, I met these kids. Let me tell you, he's not often exposed to Miami-Dade kids, right? He said, he said, I met these kids and I didn't think that they were poor kids or minority kids. I only thought, these are extraordinary kids. And I wondered, why the hell didn't we see them before last year and the year before last year? We can't allow ourselves to rely on too narrow a definition of merit. Do we really know that kids with lower SAT scores can't compete, or do we know that SAT scores only identify some great kids? Have we employed enough measures and criteria to identify the talent? We want to find traditional and non-traditional students. We want to find the next Einstein, the next Obama, the next Sotomayor. But what we do to ensure that people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, get a chance to pursue the, pursue the American dream has to be a multifaceted solution. Our entrepreneurs have to innovate, our business leaders and foundations have to fund, our community leaders and activists have to speak out, and our institutions of higher education have to be in the mix. They have to play a role. They have to broaden the way they see who is deserving. For the well-intentioned individual, this can be a maddening prospect, right? Either we set a student up for failure or we deny him access to pursue the American dream. But that either or is a false dichotomy. It's a false measure of aptitude to look only at test scores. And it's a cop-out for institutions of higher education to believe that they exist only to educate the smartest when smart is defined by too narrow a set of criteria. We have to fix K through 12, but we can't let generations slip through the cracks while we're waiting. These kids are out there, and they're ready, and they're hopeful, and we can't let them down.
Thank you. Can we put lights on? We thought people might want to yell at me or talk or ask questions or talk to each other. And so does anybody want to make a comment or say something from your experience or ask a question? Yeah. And there are mics if you want them. Uh, I, th I think there is like a, a way out of this entire uh, mess that you've been addressing. And we have some experience with it. And uh, it's not all that radical anymore. And the idea is, is that you take public schools, particularly in inner cities, but even elsewhere, and you, simp you simply uh, adopt charter schools in place of public schools. They're, uh, they're publicly funded, they're privately operated, and with some exceptions, by and large, they just do very well. And they beat most public schools, hands down, particularly where they've been tried in inner cities. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, maybe simply extending publicly funded education from the 12th grade to the 16th. The cutoff at 12 is just, is just something historical. There's no particular reason for it at all. And uh, I don't buy them. We don't have the money argument. We, we have money for whatever we want to do. We really want to do it, we find it, even if it means going into trillion dollar deficits. Mm. But those are some of the things that are. Can you say to me. your name and who you, just so people know who yeah, you are? Yeah, uh, Mar Marvin Brams. I'm at the uh, Divinity School. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we can, are there posse scholars in here that want to help? Oh my God, look at all the posse scholars. <laughs> Yay! You guys, it may be awkward to come up to a mic. We can also pass the mics around, but. Hi, um, my name is Lynette Correa, and your last comment was there's kids out there, and I'm one of those kids that's in here. Um, I didn't have the fortune of being a posse scholar, but I, what I will say is that on both sides of my family, they had a, you know, my great grandparents, my grandparents had less than a fifth grade education. Mm -hmm. My mother and my father, respectively, had an eighth grade and 11th grade education. I'm the first of four, and all four of my siblings graduated high school. Two of us went to college. One of us went, has a, is in a master's program right now. And I myself, I'm a serial social entrepreneur, <laughs> and I employ others. Love it. Thank you. And what's interesting is that I was in an alumni association uh, meeting and board of trustees meeting at Lesley University. That's where I ended up. I graduated from O'Brien High School. I have an O'Brien High School alum peer here, Shella, <laughs> who is going to hopefully apply for the EDD program here. And what was interesting, they asked us, you know, what has kept you connected to the Leslie University campus? And one of the things I had mentioned was I want to continue to make sure that this particular campus gives people a chance that are not only the first in their family to graduate from high school, but the first in their family to graduate with a college degree. Yeah. Because their motto is, let's wake up the world. And guess what? It's going to take all sorts of people to wake up the world. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Kratzok. I'm an alum of the Ed School. I graduated from the master's program in higher ed last year, and I'm currently working as a college counselor at a charter school in Roxbury. Um, and I just I want to respond to the earlier comment that our students, their charter school students, their great students, their test scores are right on the level of what you were referring to for the large city schools. Um, their GPAs are not high. We're a rigorous school. They don't just get A's. Um, and we currently have 11 posse semifinalists, wow. which I'm thrilled about. But for those students um, who do not continue on, um, and for the rest of my students who are great students, um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you have any other ideas. You know, I, I look at SAT optional colleges for them. I look at a variety of other things. They're involved in all sorts of enrichment programs, which is great. Um, but it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to find options for them. How, how many of you are in? the field of education yourself. So that's one thing we can do. I bet if we went around the room, you're in charter schools, you're in public schools, you're in colleges and universities, you're working for Department of Ed, you're doing all these amazing things, but we're not doing things together. 
And we often compete for resources, so we sometimes are wary of that. But one thing we can do that would be really powerful and we don't do it, and I say the same thing to college presidents, is we don't make our voice loud. Why aren't we writing joint op-eds to the, the local newspapers or to the national newspapers? Why aren't we writing papers and publishing and putting some resources together and doing public service announcements? That's one thing we can do because we live in our little silos and it's, it couldn't be more important. Hi. Hey, uh, I'm Mark Sterling. I'm a Pot Scholar at BU. Um, where, where are you from? I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I don't speak that much, so if I sound a little nervous, because I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had more like a question for you. I was a little confused about some of the slides you had. And um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I saw was, well, when I was in, when I got a scholarship, and I got it in December, and I was really excited. And I told people, you know, I'm going, I got a full ride to BU. I was really excited. And they were like, oh, so you got another minority scholarship. And I explained to them, no, it's a leadership scholarship showing like really, I actually did really well on SATs and my, I had really good grades. But they also show like the rest of the things that I'd done. Like I was, um, I've done a lot of cellists and a lot of other things. And they saw that and they were like, oh, well, you know, I saw I got a scholarship. They're like, oh, it must still be a minority thing. Don't worry about it. And um, I was like, oh, <laughs> I was expecting that. Like, wow, I, that's strange to me. But look, they, they told me, like, Mark, well, look, how many minority students are in your posse? How many minority students are in your other are in other posses? I started looking at it myself. It seems to me like the definition of merit is focused mainly towards white students, I guess. And when you say you want to expand the definition of merit, I'm not sure how necessary that is, because you say you get a merit scholarship. You know what you have to get this grade point average. You have to get this SAT score for a merit scholarship. And then the students who don't, they don't. And I'm not really blaming that on them, but if you know you have to get like a 3.5 to get a scholarship, then get yourself a 3.5. Don't blame, like, I live in a low income area. I can't get myself a 3.5. I really don't understand how mm -hmm. you're looking for, I don't, I feel like, it sounds really bad given that I am a posse scholar, but I feel like, <laughs> like you know, I feel like this, it's directed towards people who, who maybe, deserve it. Yeah, who deserve they, it. They got the best grades, the best test scores. They deserve the merit scholarship. They deserve so the merit scholarship. Why change that? But I'm confused as to why. Say okay, you're saying it's still you're saying pot scholarship as you, is, as you say it is is merit scholarship. Right. Then why don't these same people get merit scholarships? What why, same people? Why are, are whites underrepresented in posse in posse different posses? Right. That why why do we only have 10 percent of our posse scholars that are white kids? Yes. Right. So, okay, you're asking two questions. First of all, and I'd love other people's response to that because I think that's getting at the heart mm -hmm. of what people never admit to worrying about, right? One question that you're asking is why can't we just let the word merit be equated with high test scores and high grades? Why, why mess with that? And if it's mostly white kids and mostly Asian kids that get the merit scholarships, well, that's what it is. Right? I agree with that. Right. That's, that's one yeah. statement that you're making. And I'd love to know what other people in this room think about that. You, you want to say something about that? Oh, uh, yeah, very quickly. Who, uh, who are you? Oh, my name is Daniel. Um, that assumes that everyone is uh, at the same playing field, that everyone has had the same opportunities up to that point, and that the cost of obtaining, I guess, these particular criteria, or meeting these particular criteria, or meeting these particular indicators are the same for all individuals, which is not true at all in the U.S. Okay, so, so did you hear that? So there's a, we don't have to agree on this, right? In fact, there's a movement among some admissions deans to get rid of the use merit altogether because it's too loaded. But that hasn't happened yet. And so what ends up happening is you end up saying, I, I'm so simplifying this, well, the black kids and the Latino kids, they don't deserve to be on campus in the same way that the whites and Asians kids do. That's not OK from my perspective, OK? And if you look at Bill Bowen and Derek Bach, and what they wrote a book called uh, The Shape of the River, and they talked about this idea that we need to expand the definition of merit because merit means deserving. You deserve to be here. 
if you want to say we're going to give you a, a test score scholarship, a, you know, an academic scholarship, fine. I got an academic scholarship. But a merit scholarship, the word has so much meaning that we end up, that's why people walk up to you and say you got a you know, minority scholarship. Why is that? Why are they doing that? You didn't get a minority scholarship. Posse doesn't even screen for race. That's, hello? <laughs> you did not get a minority scholarship. You, is it, has that sunk into your head? You're defending it, but you have to believe it. You got a leadership scholarship. There are 12,000 kids. 480 got the scholarship. You're one of them. Hello? That's, that's you're the cream of the crop. But we have to keep saying that because too many people assume otherwise. The reason there's only 10% Asian kids or white kids in Posse is because where are we recruiting from? We're recruiting from big urban public schools, which is where we need to do a lot of our work. But we're not screening for race. Oh, are you, are you back? You're back. No, I actually had a question. So okay. uh, you spoke briefly, and I really enjoyed your presentation on how America's uh, definition of merit is very myopic. I'm wondering uh, what indicators then we can use to expand this definition and what empirical research we can provide to maybe college admissions officers or um, employers to prove that these indicators actually do imply that someone is worthy of. Yeah, we definitely need research. We do. But there's a, just so that we can satisfy skeptics, but there's Bill Sedlicek and Sternberg there's stuff we've done here at Harvard um, with Gary Orfield and Derek Bach. There's, there's Bill Bowen stuff. Um, and all of that supports the idea that you can use multiple measures to identify talent. What could they be? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of my question. Are there any Honestly, emerging yes. indicators? Yes. I, I, the reason I'm not answering right away is because I want you to Posse kids, what are they? They're leadership and initiative. They're a whole bunch. Go ahead. You want to just throw some out? Right. So, so Sternberg has employed um, a, a measure that's, that analyzes a paper application and essay. Tufts University has used it, and what they do is they look at non-cognitive traits in addition to the traditional measures of scores and grades, and they make that a piece of how they admit students. Right? They get different students that way. Posse uses something called the dynamic assessment process. We put students in a dynamic setting. We watch them as they interact in groups. And the things we look for are the things you would look for if you were hiring somebody for a leadership track position when these kids are only 17 years old. So they're not afraid to line up here and talk in front of people they don't know. They're not afraid to sit in the front of the class and raise their hand. Are they going to succeed at 90%? If you remember all those slides in the beginning, they had all sorts of non-traditional genius. Miles Davis? You think that he, I don't know, maybe he would get a perfect SAT score. He might have, but maybe he didn't. We need to be able to recognize that talent. Marilyn Monroe, a lot of people think she's the dittiest person in the world. But you could read her bio, and some people think she was really smart. She mar married Arthur Miller. Had it, you know. <laughs> I know that doesn't mean, but. but <laughs> Did she? Wow. So we don't know. We can't base what we believe to be deserving on one measure. I don't know. Should we, we alternate? Yeah. yeah that, um, I, there are a lot of um, aspiring education entrepreneurs throughout, throughout the entire Here? Huxley campus. Right. <laughs> and one of the amazing things about Posse is not only that um, you all have identified this issue in this way and quantified it in this way, but it's the approach with all the stakeholders mm -hmm. who it creates this amazing win-win that everybody seems to be really, really satisfied with. And especially when you are going to 
colleges and universities that you partner with and sort of putting this information in their faces and saying, yeah. this is what you're not doing. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how not only you identified the problem, but you're thinking around crafting the model so that everybody won and how that might have implications for and, other people who are thinking say about Say who you are and, and what you do, just so people know. My name is Anthony Jewett. I am a member of the EDLD cohort here <laughs> at Hugsy. All my EDLDs. Such a good, that's congratulations. Um, the, it, you're making a really important point, which is how do you build collaborative movements, right? How do you, how do you build joint ventures, you know, private, public ventures? How do you get business involved and make everybody a partner? It's so important. And we play the rules of the, the hierarchical system we live in. So it's not, it sounds bad, but when we want a university to sign on, only the president can make the decision. We will only talk to the board of trustees. We need buy-in from the top. We need the symbolic leadership. And once we get that, we need every constituent group on campus engaged, but we need that first. And it, you put pressure, but you also bring them in as a partner when you say, Chancellor of, of you know, Cal, will you do this? And if you do it, you got to bring everybody on board. It just, it's a huge difference. So, I mean, that's, I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's so important to, to build those collaborative relationships. Hi. Hi, my name is Vanya Pantic. I'm a BU Posse II scholar. Yay. So, for, and from Atlanta. So, first of all, I wanted to thank you for creating this amazing program because <laughs> if it weren't, <laughs> um, if it weren't for the program, I couldn't have probably gone to one of the schools that was my top choice for mostly financial reasons. Um, I came to the U.S. as a refugee from Bosnia, so we sort of fell into that awkward category of, you know, not doing financially well but working extraordinarily hard and I come from a single parent household so all of those factors made it very difficult but at the same time it was amazing to have someone a group of people recognize the work that my mom had been doing and the work that I'd been doing to get here and I just wanted to thank you for that and ask you what you thought about because a lot of these statistics rely greatly on race so they divide categories into something that I see as sort of strained because it's white and black and then it's Asian mm -hmm. and Hispanic. Mm -hmm. But I see Hispanic and Asian, and we've had these conversations multiple times on BU's campus as more of a cultural association. And on our cultural, at our cultural center on BU's campus, which is where I've met a lot of amazing friends and where I actually tend to hang out between classes, um, we've had this conversation because we don't see most of us anyway, black, for example, is a Haitian person considered black because they're Caribbean? Oh. Is a Nigerian person here considered yes. black because they're African? Am I considered white? I came from Bosnia. And you know, those culture, I think that these sorts of things, like the census, for example, in France, on the census, you can't even ask for race. So it's not even considered in things like schools, yet you see a lot more diversity and a lot more integration of these various cultures. And it's not so much about race. Yes. So your picture is up there. What about the Middle Eastern population? Yeah. Are they are not represented. They are not acknowledged well enough. At our very own university, the Admissions Diversity Board reaches out to the black and Hispanic communities. What about your Pakistani community? What about your Middle right. Easterns? There, and I mean, yes, these statistics show a great deal of division between these races, but ultimately, I believe it comes down to culture and ethnicity, and that's what people identify themselves with more so than their race, which is a broad category that simply puts people in a group. And that we they continue to do that in this country, yes. don't we? So yeah. what can we do to... What can we do? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're totally Don't you right. think that admissions boards should be looking more at those things, if anything, well, it's ridiculous. If you look at it, we, we had a slide that we took out that was the Asian students. There were like five million different categories of Asian students, right? Japanese and Chinese and Thai and Korean. And they all have, if you start to really break it down like that, different graduation rates. Same thing with the black students, same thing with Latino. Are they Latino? Are they Hispanic? Are they Cuban? Are they Puerto Rican? Are they Dominican? Where, where are they from? So we have to constantly say what you just said and act on that. The data is important because it tells us a story. 
and we can't ignore that because we need to use it. We need to use it as a lever, and we need to, but we can't leave that piece of it out. We need to use that as part of our argument. And I love what you said, and do what you're doing. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jason Rafferty. I'm a master's student here and also a doctoral student at the medical school. I was wow. wondering, um, looking at the... <laughs> looking <is> typical. <laughs> going back to the slide you had where you pointed out the 1970s and how all, yeah. all races were overlapped. You know, it struck me because you mentioned that it seemed like everyone was in higher education, but I, I would argue that everyone wasn't because the rates kept going up. And I'm wondering how much, uh, well, I agree with you, this I is a problem. I didn't say everyone was in higher education. I said they were going to college at the same rate. Well, that's what I'm getting at. I'm wondering yeah. how, how much, I, I agree with you, this is a problem in selection and recruitment, but I'm wondering how much of it is also a problem in terms of space. Why should we be limiting our talent? Should we be redistributing some of our resources from recruitment and selection into expanding the number of spots we have available for the number of talented people that we have? So say more about that. In what way might we do that? creating more seats in college, creating more, I mean, in the medical profession, for example, in the next five to 10 years, I think we're projecting like five medical schools opening, which might be a thousand more doctors. But that's not gonna solve problems with, with primary care. That's not gonna create huge shifts in terms of eth ethnic diversity, that in, in and of itself. I think that, you know, do we need to expand more? Yeah, make college more available to more people. Exactly. And, and really, my, my talk was focused on the elite schools. So it's, it's a really, it, and if you could press the button, would you get rid of a hierarchy in the education system? I'm not saying you have to answer, I'm just <laughs> asking. It's, I, I don't, it, I'm just assuming you don't need an answer to that. Because there's no answer, right? Well, I was wondering what your perception was. It's a great, yeah, you're just putting the idea out there. Which space is, is also part of this problem. How much do you think space is part of the problem? I mean, obviously space is part of a problem. But you got to be careful. You need 58,000 black kids, less than 7,000 score 1,200 on the SAT. Do you say, well, we don't have space for those kids? Do you say we don't have space for kids that didn't score as well? Do you think we're taking slots away from more deserving white kids who scored better? Well, I think that's what I'm getting at. Is ah. rather than rather than taking spots away, do we need Just to create cre more spots? Exactly. Just hire more teachers and build bigger classrooms. And I don't have, I mean, I don't have an answer. That's a great, it's a question. Okay. Hi. Hi, my name is Aretha. I'm also a Posse scholar, B Posse 2 from Atlanta. Um, I came just from. just so dominate. Yeah. <laughs> no, I came um, from an inner city school in Atlanta, 99% uh, black. Um, you know, came here. And what I realized is it's not only uh, the student population that characterizes, you know, um, the posse scholarship as one of minorities. But it's also uh, the administration, um, the, you know, the trustees, and I, I bet you even the president views this as his way to gain more minorities on campus. So one of the biggest problems that we have to face as students, uh, as posse scholars, is how do we can change, you know, we're not just you know, that minority students on campus because we have, you know, you know, um, students who are not minorities, you know, we have them on but campus. there's that perception. There's that perception. And, you know, we're working, you know, as a group to change that perception that, you know, we're a dynamic group, you know, and we're working hard, yeah. you know, that, you know, that we should be judged by the merit of our character and not just because we're a minority, you know. So it's we give you uh, the one of the problem work. is, huh? We give you the hard work. <laughs> we do. We have the hardest. We have the hardest job yeah. because walking down the street, it's like, you know, are you mon You know, you came here on a minority right. scholarship. You don't deserve to be here. But it's like, yeah. you know, we're busting our butts, you know, to do the best we can, you know. And especially at BU, when it's really hard, it's really competitive, and we're working, you know, I, I, I would say three times as hard as any of the other students to prove our worth and show that we're, you know, you we're just as good, that. right? You know, right? Yeah. So. Right. <laughs> You're just as good as enough of a statement. I think the fact that you are here, you're better. And uh, I teach advanced placement statistics at an independent school in the North Shore. And uh, we talk a lot about outliers in that class. 
and as Malcolm Gladwell said, these kids are outliers in the truest statistical sense of the term. It doesn't take a lot of data to recognize that. All the stuff that you've shown us tonight, they are outliers. And I guess my question to you has to do with the slide you put up uh, with the uh, Phillips Exeter insignia, uh, Roxbury Latin, the elite independent schools in the country, places that politicians, uh, economically elite, socially, culturally elite, send their kids to. The Obamas moved to Washington, and they probably spent about three minutes before they decided they were going to send their kids to Sidwell and not D.C. public schools. <laughs> And I, and I voted for the president, I'm going to do it again, I love the Obamas. <laughs> but they spent probably about two and a half minutes before they decided to send their kids to Sidwell, right? The president is a graduate of Punahou School, our governor is a graduate of Milton Academy. And, and it's no secret that these schools are up to something that's working for posse kids, for ABC kids, and others. I guess my question is, and I'd like you to comment on, if you buy the premise to the question, if we are a test nation country, a uh, uh, test crazy country right now, Arne Duncan and company, more tests, MCAS, national standards, uh, the debate seems to be around which test and at what cost, to what extent, rather than a debate that is around making the inner city schools, public schools in general, but the inner city schools especially, more like places like Sidwell where people choose to send their kids when they often have a choice. Mm -hmm. Meaning, a school day that goes past one o'clock or two o'clock, uh, teachers who are expert in their subject, people who run the buildings that are autonomous of legislatures and school committees, uh, physical plants that are cathedral-like, program offerings that go on and on and on. And it's no wonder that kids succeed when they're put in that environment. And, and if you buy the premise, which is we're a test crazy nation, and we think our solution to K through 12 especially is standardized tests, why do you think the national dialogue is around that and not around making places more like, whether you call them charter schools or Sidwell or other places with these kinds of features, why isn't the conversation more like that? Why aren't we putting our resources to making our schools more like those schools? But I couldn't agree with you more. It's not rocket science. We know we know it works, right? Did you want? Do you want to say something? I want to piggyback on this question of some reactions or some of these things that you said. There's too much coming in. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dr. Eli Brooks, and I'm a physicist. Uh, my concern is exactly what you raised, and what you did with Bonnet being in the audience twice when you said. Reminded me of those fractured dialogues where Du Bois talked about you being the talent of ten. Mm. You know, it's an implicit affirmation of the class system. And with all the respect, and I'm don't hurry, worry. I'm, no, yep. no, I'm not criticizing. You can. I'm trying to understand <laughs> something. But I'm not criticizing. The title of the forum was the politics of race and class. We have not discussed the politics of race and class. And a number of young people have come up here and have made statements which I, as an old head, have reacted to because I've heard these statements 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned about the same being in the same intellectual trap that we were in 30 and 40 years ago. Right. So if you could spend a few moments, because you have worked very hard, and kudos to you. You deserve it. <laughs> I would, I would be happy to, and I would be happy to open it up. I disagree that I haven't talked about the politics of race and you class. about the results of the politics of race the po if, if what you mean is that we live in a racist society where many of our institutions have kind of systematized racism, right? It's in, it's in the system, right? We can talk about that, too. The, po the politics of race and class, it's a huge topic, right? Do you do you want to add? Do you want to add something? You can add. No, no, I want. You <laughs> what you're saying I'm, is so I'm important. Saying, I'm saying it's been when it comes to black folks, right? The 
issue is different. You can't diffuse the issue with other stuff because what happens to us is we always get shuffled to the bottom in the game. And that's what happened with affirmative action in the 70s. Right. All right? All of a sudden, everybody else got in, and we have nothing against everybody else getting a piece of the pie. No, we're not fighting that. But in that process, we got shoveled to the bottom. Yeah. It's not an accident, right, that you have 6,000 black kids there, as opposed to the 56 or the 60, or the 68,000 that you want. Mm -hmm. right? That's not an accident. Mm -hmm. The point is that we don't talk about why is it that? Why is it that black yeah. kids are so underrepresented in this process? Yes. And I think it's a separate topic. And I thought you were going to talk about that tonight, about race. Maybe I misunderstand. Maybe I misunderstand your question, right? So. I, what you're saying is, no, no, don't, it's good, it's good. I was at yeah. City College in open admission. I was there, I was part of that Yes. Group, so I did open admission, all right? We, op we democratized higher education in this country. I know the game, I know what happened. I know what we lost in home rule when the Republicans came in right. and bailed out the city of New York in 1974. I know the game, I've seen this history. I, I think so I'm praising what you're doing, at the yeah, same yeah, yeah. Time, I'm concerned about yeah. right, not rebuilding the same kind of class, yes. pseudo, you know, pseudo, uh, you know, the best of the best, you know. Systems. So the, the right. part of what happens, right, is we're, you have a million, there's a million things in what you're saying, and I would love other people to chime in, right? If you're asking about why we have been perpetuating a class system based on race, right, where is the racism? It's everywhere, right? I'm, a, you know, my only expertise comes from doing this program for 21 years. All I'm doing, all we're doing at Posse, is trying to connect great kids to great colleges. We do have a problem. The black and, and Latino students of color, the underrepresented students, are going to the worst schools. They're in the poorest communities. They're underemployed. I mean, we'll, it goes on and on. The, the racism of that, right, the racism perpetuates the class system. And we're governed by a good old boys network in this country that it's hard to change. So what our strategy, our strategic position is not, let's get as many kids as we can, which is a wonderful goal. Some people want to get as many kids as they can into the best effort. Our goal at Posse is to get a certain critical mass, it's a tipping point, a certain number of young people who represent the real diversity of the nation into leadership positions so that when future decisions start to get, are getting made, they will better represent your voice and your voice and your voice and your voice. Go ahead. Yes. I have my student two degrees from Harvard. And I, I am uh, MPH and MDiv, and, I, and I'm of that era, you know, of, of, we, of your era. And, 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 and it doesn't work. It, they've already started that. When you have people having internal, what it, we're talking about, it's internalized oppression. When we get into the system, mm -hmm. we, when we get into the system, we try to be what the majority say, seeking approval of the other to become you. We do not celebrate who we are. So that part of the education that we need to do, and I'm working on it, <laughs> you know, maybe we could collaborate. We'll collaborate. Yeah. Well, part of the thing that we could do is to, to we got to do some psychology. In addition to, this, to the, to the, to the uh, academics of the math and the science and the reading and the so forth, of saying that you are good already, your hair is okay, you know, and that is the issue. Because when they get the jobs, we already know that with the affirmative action, the five that are there, who are they promoting? There were more than five that was there in 1978, <laughs> in those years. Yeah. And when you get into those positions, well, I'm not like them, them. That's exactly right. They said the same thing. Like who? Is that what you meant? We're not like them? But we're trying to. I don't know if that's what, what they I, meant. 
But let me finish my little bit. No, she's down. <laughs> and, so wait, wait, no. I think we might be off on a little bit of a tan. Yeah. This is good. Let's go. Let's but stay. But what I'm her. saying yeah. is that in the process of building, that you cannot. What what I would like to reiterate to the young people of color that you're all right just the way you are. And you're, you know, and that's important because we don't say that anywhere. Right. You're not, and you're, so you're talking about messaging and branding and culture I mean, and identity. You say, if you, if yeah. You come into a place from Atlanta. I mean, you know, I'm not saying Atlanta. My folks in Atlanta. But you know how I'm from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> you got to learn how to use the vernacular and be a part of your community. I say folks someplace and, and wherever when I'm giving my scientific presentation of something else. And I still know who I am and I love all parts of me. And that's what the kids need to right. learn. We got, wait, we got two options. But what I'm saying wait, wait, is... Wait, 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 wait. We got two options. Uh -huh. One is we could revolt. And maybe... No, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> and I don't care if you quote me on that. And this country okay. might be ready for that. Because if nothing's working, seriously, if nothing is working, why not rise up? Where is... The, where are the masses? Where's the public view? Where is the unite, united front to correct some injustices. But the other, wait, there's two, there's two. The other is I don't want to give up on what you're talking about. We, we need you where you are. Yeah. I don't want to say, well, it's not working, so we don't need you there. We need these posse scholars, because I want them running for office. I want them to become senators. It's part of the establishment, but we need them in there, right? I know right? you need them there, and I'm not saying that yeah, they yeah. shouldn't be there, but if you're there and you're trying to negate who you are when you get there, you no, know, you're not back, doing that, are you guys? Loving yourself. It goes, you know, you are you negating? Know. I don't think. No, no. Are you but you don't want. Some to... people don't know that. I just kind of want to respond to are, what's her. going on. My name is Danielle Galloway. I'm also a BU Posse 2 scholar. I love how all you guys came. Yes, my entire posse is here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. My response is, and I don't want to get everybody's emotions riled up or whatever or make it any worse, but I don't compare myself to the students at BU or to any other race because I really don't see myself, I don't look in the mirror and say, well, I need to do better because I'm a black student. That is not how I think of myself. I know that I deserve to be at BU, so I do my best and I work as hard as I can as a student at BU, not as a black student at BU, but just as a student. Correct. And I don't like when people feel like I need to compare myself to these other students mm -hmm. to prove something. Why? Because my skin is a different color. I got here just the same way as you did. And being that I'm a posse scholar means that the admissions dig a little deeper to get to know who I was before they accepted me. Now, I was on CNN the year I graduated because I grew up homeless. And a lot of people told me all the time that I would never amount to anything, that I was going to end up homeless, and that that's all that I deserved. And my thing was, for me, I had a lot of teachers who believed in me and just let me know that you deserve to be, the, be at the best school, to have the best, to have these opportunities presented to you just as anybody else, not because you're black, not because you come from a lower class, right. just because you work hard and you tried. Right. And so when I hear people say stuff like, you know, you got this scholarship because you're black right. or because, you know, they need it to represent black students on campus, I really ignore it because I know in my spirit that I wouldn't be here if I didn't deserve to be here. That's exactly right. And that's what Pasa is. <laughs> Thank you. So just to respond to what I'm hearing, I, d I don't think that it's for us to sit there and question who we are or question what we're trying to be. It's really for us in ourselves personally to know already that it doesn't really matter what you look like. It really doesn't matter what the world sees you, see you as, as long as you realize what you see yourself as. Right. We have time for only a couple more. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're awesome. All right, I'll try to keep this brief if I can remember what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, so I might be a little bit more critical. Um, more and, critical? And, and the thing... 
And the thing that I'm gonna be critical of is just the fact that we are all very complicit in this injustice. I mean, if you look around, we're all here. And when you, I don't know if you notice when you come through the halls, past all these posters with all these white people, I think there was one poster at the very end that had a black woman on it. And these are all the previous administrators. I'm thinking, fuck, no wonder we're screwed. You know? Because this is the reality, this is the institution that actually constructs the structure, the people that develop the structures that we feed into. And these are the statistics that show us what the products and the results of are. Now, the sad thing about it is that, and as much as you know, I know a lot of people here at the Ed School and I respect them tremendously, I know they do tremendous here comes work. The and, but. <laughs> you know, they, they tout themselves as being the nexus pra intersection of practice and policy, right? Which is interesting because it's not until very recently they, just, they decide to develop this program with the EDLD, which, well, if they were really that involved in creating transformational change within the system, then what would this program be necessary for? It seems like, from my perspective, Harvard's realized the jig is up. They actually have to be legit with what they're talking and be able to walk that walk. Now, fortunately, the EDLD is not entirely composed of your, I guess, traditional white prototypical male. There's much more diversity. And so that gives me at least some hope. But my question to you is, what advice would you give to the several few of them who have come out tonight? Um, raise, raise your hand if you're in the EDLD program. So what kind of advice would you give to them, uh, the members of this select cohort, which if you're not familiar with the EDLD, it's a program which intersects the business school with the ed school as well as the KSG and gives them a kind of comprehensive background in policy, um, actually managerial experience and implementation with regards to actual educational background. Um, I guess some of the common elements that seem to be missing in actually being able to implement transformative change. So this is a great cohort and I think they're going to do many great incredible things. Um, but from yours or anyone else's perspective, what advice would you have for them in terms of being able to really create that structural transformative change on a nationwide and hopefully at some point global wide level um, that is necessary to create a more just society? Okay. I think the most important thing that you're talking about is the word structural. Absolutely. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, that you do small things that, that are sometimes really big. On many major college and university campuses, we've created a new position called Vice President for Institutional Diversity or Dean of Multicultural Affairs, right? And what do we, we charge that person with? They're in charge of all the programs that deal with people of color. And posse, this is small, but it's an example of what you're talking about. We go in and we say, and, and maybe related to what you're talking about too a little bit, we go in and we say, we need a liaison, and it can't be that person. That person does a lot, they're important, they're great, but it can't be that person. And for every incoming posse, is the mentor here, is your Shirley here? Shiny is your name? Nice to meet you. Are you a faculty member at BU? I'm actually a staff member. I'm the director of learning here today. Okay, great. So for every mentor that gets assigned to a posse, we say we want someone different on your campus. Physics professor. French literature professor. Dean of student affairs. And every year it's someone different. Why do we do that? It's a structural strategy decision. We say we want the campus to own systemic change. And if everybody is involved in the dialogue, you begin to change the paradigm a little bit. I think the people that have been selected for the EDLD program are, are God, so impressive. They could all give a speech like this up here, about, and we could all have lots of disagreement too. And <laughs> but, <laughs> although I don't think we really do. But, but to me, if you can work on systemic change, structure that keeps something permanent, a change permanent, you're much better off than if you just change a stat or a number or create a position. We have time for one more question. Okay, sorry, we're, we're gonna take one more. I know everyone's gonna wanna, it's okay. 
I don't know if I really deserve to be the last one. Um, I came up here mostly to respond to some of the Posse scholars. I'm sorry, my name is Eliza Udell McClelland. I'm in a master's program here. And I've been a DAP interviewer for the past five years. Oh. I've been a writing coach. And to hear that you don't think that, that you necessarily have the merit to be at the top colleges. Did somebody say that? No, no, that you challenge what the definition of merit is. That you challenge the definition of what merit is and how they're seeing you as meritorious. Is that is meritorious? That? <laughs> meritorious. I'm at Harvard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makeup work. I just and also the last Posse scholar whose name I don't remember um, spoke about uh, spoke about something <laughs> really great. Um, anyway, what? Yeah. Well, she spoke about being true to herself, but she also spoke about how much she went through to get the Posse Scholarship. And I think it's important to remember that most of the kids at BU, if they had gone through the DAP process, wouldn't have gotten there. The DAP, DAP process is so hard. The DAP process sees you as a full person much more than a piece of paper application. So I'm just so impressed by all of you. So I want you to know that and hear that. And whether or not you're the best of the best, because I know we're challenging these definitions, it's important for you guys to all realize how impressive you are. And I've taught in independent schools, and I've taught in public schools. And teaching with Posse has made me go back to teaching, because I miss it. I miss working with these kids, okay. and okay. they're so impressive. What I wanted to bring up, though, uh, as well as that, is um, you keep pointing to collaboration. And I think that's one of the things that I want to remember leaving here today, that Posse is based on collaboration. It's this group of 10. And they support each other and succeed together. And I think when you mentioned during your slideshow that people needed to collaborate in order to succeed, that happens K through 12. That happens at the higher ed. And I don't know how to make it happen everywhere. But I think that's what we need for all of us to succeed. EDLD, maybe you guys can lead us there. But <laughs> Anyway, well. I don't want to take up more of your time. So. Look, thank you. So look, all of you, I want to thank those of you who were brave enough to say things that weren't being said. And I want to thank you for allowing me to spend all this time in front of you talking and babbling on. And if all this does is get us to talk more afterwards, then that's great. And I hope I get to come back. You guys are wonderful. And thanks for having me.